with the weekend of March 31st and April the 1st and be praying about who God wants you to bring on Easter weekend. Every year, Rock Springs Christian Academy holds a silent and live auction to help raise money to make this ministry an affordable option for families. We would love for you to join us as we support our school in investing into the next generation. Mark your calendars for Saturday, March the 3rd, and we'll see you there. If it's your first time at Rock Springs, take a moment to fill out the decision card located in between the seat next to you. You can let us know if you have a prayer request or if you've made a decision today. Simply fill out the information on that card so that we can better serve you. Hey, that's it for us. Thanks again for choosing to spend your weekend at Rock Springs Church. For more information, you can check us out online or on social media. We hope you have a great week. Good morning, Rock Springs. Stand with us. If you are a guest with us today, we want you to know how grateful we are that you are here worshiping with us. And we just pray that you feel at home today. Lord, we are singing about a God who has overcome. We want him to have his way in this service today. Amen. Let's lift our voices to him. Let our praise you're welcome and let our songs be a sign we are here for you yes we are we are here for you let your breath come from heaven and fill our hearts 
for you have never failed me yet. You know this, sing this with us. Your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my beside me, Jesus. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, your
Folks, you may be seated. I'm grateful the Lord will make a way. Amen? He'll always make a way. He's faithful. And we exalt Him and we praise Him. We don't have to, but we get to worship the Lord with our giving. Let us pray and then we'll worship the Lord with our giving. Jesus, we love you. I pray you'll bless the gift and the giver, for I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Pray this song is a blessing to you today. No matter what you're going through, you can trust him. Thank you, Jesus. When this life is over, And I feel like giving up. I will cling to all you've promised. It will always be enough. When the world around me crumbles, and it's hard to understand.
Well, it's been a great, wonderful month, and we've tried to have a surprise every Sunday. Five o'clock today, we've got a surprise singer that everybody enjoys. Uh, boy, he, uh, he does a wonderful, wonderful job. I'll let you know. I'll give you this hint. He was Rod Stewart last night, and uh, he does a great, great job. Uh, we got a surprise for you today. All the way from Monroe, Louisiana. Monroe, Louisiana, Duck Dynasty. Make welcome Alan and Lisa Robertson. Would you do that? Alan and Lisa, you've been such a blessing to us. You're the uh, beardless bro, right? You're the it's beardless me. bro. Alan, did you, uh, did you ever think, folks, by the way, if there's anybody in here who's not familiar with Duck Dynasty, would you raise your hand? You're not. If you are, raise your hand. My, isn't that awesome? That's awesome. Alan, did you all ever think the show would reach what it's reached? We were as shocked as anybody. Uh, as you can imagine. And the show is so popular and it took off so fast that, you know, people started comparing it to other shows. Mm -hmm. And so they said, you know, what's it like? You, you got to watch this show. And it's like, well, there's bearded rednecks. I, I just can't quite explain. They pray at the end of meals. And this is kind of like Andy Griffith meets the Waltons who the Dukes of Hazzard come by for a visit. I mean, that's kind of the... <laughs> nature of the show and I thought well that's not too bad because I like you know all those shows I always compared our show to the Munsters you remember the Munsters because you know it was about a family of monsters with this beautiful cousin that came to live with them and it was her name was Marilyn she had an identity complex because she was beautiful I remember in a family of monsters I can completely relate to Marilyn Munster <laughs> if you've seen my family you know right Lisa says I'm the best looking Robertson but I said babe the bar is so low I don't even know <laughs> How much of a compliment that is, but best looking, smartest, wisest. How long is this? You know, she's got. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, ladies, listen, listen. <laughs> Admiration. But I tell you, uh, in seriousness, uh, Pastor Benny, the uh, you know the prayer at the end of the show, I think, is what really, really connected with Americans. You know, and and you know they didn't get it in New York, they didn't get it in L.A., but everybody else got it how important it was for a family to give praise to God. And so, you know, at one point, thank you. At one point we noticed, dad noticed, they started, they were taken in Jesus' name out of the prayer. You know, and, and it's not a huge thing, but it was to us, and, and it just really bothered dad. And so dad asked them, they said, well, we, we don't want to offend people, you know, and they went through this whole, you know, politically correct answer. Well, dad, you know, he kind of had enough of that. So next time we had... Family dinner scenes, time for dad. He said, Mr. Phil Art, you're on. So he says, all right, let's bow. Father, we thank you for this another day on planet Earth. And I just pray that all these liberals you brought in here from New York and California, <laughs> that you'll give them a chance to turn before you burn them in hell with all the other sinners out there. <laughs> and they probably won't run this, but in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> so when everybody looked up from the prayer... Their eyes were this big, all the crew, you know, and everybody. And they said, okay, Mr. Phil, that was great. Can we do it without all the burning and damnation now? Let's just try. <laughs> but it was a way of saying, you know, I don't know about New York and L.A., but here we give Jesus honor. Amen. And so that was a part Amen. of it. Lisa, I've heard a lot of testimonies, you know, been in church all these years. But last night, what a powerful story. You talked about your life and uh you talked about it, uh, and it's in the book. I would encourage people to get the book. Uh, they'll sell out, but get the book anyway. But you talked about uh, molestation. You talked about, you all talked about affair. And you all talked about abortion. You talked about all that. And, but you, I remember what so spoke to me was, am I salvageable? Is, is my life salvageable? Am I, am I of value? And, you know, we've all messed up. I've messed up, by the way, folks, maybe in different ways, but I've messed up greatly in my life, and I want you to know that. But, Lisa, what would you say to that person today that's wondering if there's there any value in them? Are they redeemable? What would you say to them? There's value in every life um, from the time it's conceived until the time that, that God takes it home. Um, and so every person doesn't matter what you've done, 
is salvageable. Um, Jesus died on the cross, and believe me, that cross is big enough to handle anything that you think you can bring to it. But I also say that you have to bring it and you have to leave it. In other words, whenever you come to him, you're going to have to repent of that. That doesn't make you perfect. just says I'm going to change who I am and I'm going to change what I'm doing. And I'm going to allow him to show me the path that I need to take. But repentance, um, repentance is one of those things where, you know, sometimes we think, oh, but I repented of that and I, ju and I just told another lie. It's not like that. It's a lifestyle. Repent. Whenever you repent of something, that means you are no longer in that lifestyle. You can still make mistakes. Believe me, we still make plenty of mistakes. Um, we're not perfect. You know, the only reason why we're salvageable is because of that blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. But every person is salvageable. Alan. I think you came on the show in the fourth season, am I correct? And you actually came on because you are a pastor. You pastor the, fam pastor the family's church, and uh, you renewed your mom and dad's, so uh, I think, 50th wedding anniversary. Alan, uh, tell me, and got a tremendous response from viewers, didn't we? Talk to me about that. Yeah, this episode was called Till Duck Do Us Part, uh, was the name of it. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it drew 11.8 million viewers which is still the record uh, for a reality TV show on cable television. What's ironic is it broke the record of nine point something million about a famous couple who divorced on their reality TV show. So I thought it was a great moment where God showed that, you know what, if people trust in him, there can be great victory, uh, even in those tough years. And so I shared last night a little bit about mom and dad in their beginning, and it wasn't like you saw in that episode. Uh, it was difficult. Dad was not a Christian. Uh, for the first uh, 10 years uh, of their marriage together and their time together. Uh, and mom really suffered because dad wasn't what he was supposed to be. He was verbally abusive and even some physically abusive to mom. And so I grew up in a very difficult home in a difficult time. And so on that episode, to get to celebrate not just the, the 50 years, but the idea that the last 40 was what God had intended for the Robertson family. And that's what trained us. And so now the four sons, now we're the patriarchs of our clans. And so it makes us want to look back and say, you know, one day we're going to be, Lord willing, at that 50-year mark. And we want that same legacy left Amen. for us. So that was Amen. a great message, you know, and a great part of the show. Lisa, last night I heard you all say that you got married in 1984, and I remembered that. But I also remembered you said we got married on November the 9th. I said that should be a national holiday. That should be a national holiday. I totally agree with that. Okay, you all got married. What, what has sustained the marriage? You've had ups, you've had downs. Listen, you, you know what I believe commitment means? This is what I believe commitment is. I believe commitment means being willing to be unhappy for a while. Commitment means being willing to be unhappy for a while because if you're not, they will come a time you will be. You say, well, God wants us to be happy. God wants us to be holy. God wants us to be holy. Where do we get this idea that God's so into us being happy? He wants us to be holy. Amen? Amen? But Lisa, what would you say, what sustained, what sustained you and Alan's marriage since 1984? Uh, well, commitment to one another. But more than anything, I think it was the love that we shared. Um, because, you know, at the 15-year mark, I, I really went into a, a bad place in our marriage. And we've been married almost 34 years. And so the last 18 has redefined who we are. Well, we would not have sustained the first 15. One, if it had not been for our love for one another. But also I think it was God's love for us because he saw something in us and he knew what we could do, but, he, but we didn't know what we could do. And so for him to be committed to us and to keep us together, and for Alan, of course, he was committed to the Lord, for all of those things to, to come together, 
and that love and that commitment, even through the hard times. Um, there were some really, really hard times. And whenever, um, whenever I came to the Lord, I was 35 years old. I thought I was a Christian, but, you know, I looked at myself and saw the things that I had been doing and where I was in my life, and I knew that I was not a Christian. And so whenever I came to the Lord and he picked me up from where I was, I was, I was dirty. See, he doesn't wait for us to get ourselves clean. He picks us up where we are. He picks us up in that muck and mire. Amen. And whenever he did that, he picked me up and he put me on solid ground and he said, you are worth my son dying on the cross. And you know what? He would say that to each and every person in here. If you were the only person, he still would have sent his son to die on the cross. Amen. Folks, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to let Alan and Lisa Robertson know how much we've enjoyed them being with us. Would you do that? Some of you are standing, the rest of you can stand. I know what some of you are thinking. I want to meet the Robertsons. Well, you'll get the opportunity to do that. They're going to be back at the table, and they've got their products, and it's wonderful, wonderful products, and they're wonderful, wonderful people. I have been preaching a series of messages called InstaFam. We've been spending a month talking about families. And today we come to the last message in the Scripture readings in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. This is what it says. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Let us pray. God, I pray today that you will speak to us and through us. God, I thank you for the worship. I thank you for the powerful testimony of the Robertsons. I thank you for what you've done in their lives. I praise you for that and how you're using them. I pray now that you'll use me because all I want to do, Lord, is preach your word. God, without your word, we're empty. It's your word that makes the difference. So I pray today that you will use us to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about parked cars and vacuums. Order in our homes. Parked cars and vacuums. Order in our home. Homes. A man brings his best buddy home for dinner. Unannounced at 5.30 after work. The wife begins screaming at him while his friend just sits and listens. My hair and my makeup are not done. The house is a mess. The dishes are not done. I'm still in my pajamas and I can't be bothered with cooking tonight. Why in the heck did you bring him unannounced to our home? Because he's thinking about getting married. (laughs) Well, the Bible is pretty clear of how our home should be. It talks about husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It talks about wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. It talks about for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. All these scriptures But then the Bible says in verse 26 that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You know what I know, folks? Last night, Alan and Lisa talked about a lot of dirt that was in their marriage. They talked about a lot of things that wasn't pure and unclean in their marriage. And while they were talking, what was rolling through my mind, we all have some impurities in our marriage. I've often said there's so much bad in the best of us and there's so much good in the worst of us, it hardly behooves any of us to talk about the rest of us. 
Billy Graham, even the late Billy Graham said, I had a good marriage, but I didn't have a perfect marriage. Nobody has a perfect marriage. All of us have some dirt. But for our marriages to get better, folks, we don't need to follow what Oprah says. For our marriages to get better, we don't need to follow what Dr. Phil says. For our marriages to get better, we don't need to follow what Dr. Spock says. For our marriages to get better, we need to follow what the Word of God says. What the Word of God says. And see, for all the impurities in my marriage and all the impurities in your marriage, the Scripture says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. This is the impurities in your marriage. When you start applying the Word of God, this is what happens. The more you apply the Word of God, this is what happens. The more you saturate yourself in the Word of God, this is what happens. The more you read, study, and apply the Word of God, this is what happens. It's the washing of water by the Word. The washing of water by the Word. What starts out, ladies and gentlemen, is dirty can end up just like that. And whatever it is in your marriage, ladies and gentlemen, whatever it is in your marriage that's not right, it can end up clear if we apply the teachings of the Word of God. Now, I'm talking to you today about parked cars and vacuums. Parked cars and vacuums. And the first statement I want to make is this. A woman can't follow a parked car. A woman can't follow a parked car. Now, I share this with a broken heart. Many men are not the spiritual leaders of their home. I believe this. I believe the only reason our country is out of order. I believe the only reason churches are out of order is because our homes are out of order. It traces back to the home. But I say this with a sympathetic heart. I think there are some reasons why men don't lead. Now I want to give you those fast. I want to give you those fast. Number one, he lacks confidence. He lacks confidence. His self-esteem perhaps has been damaged. It may go back to when he was a child. It may be a failure in his life. It may be things that were said to him as a child. But he simply lacks the confidence to lead. There's a second reason why men don't lead. Perhaps his mother was in charge. His mother was in charge. We have a propensity to develop our families just like our parents did. James Dobson said most, pa most parents parent like their families did. It's a proven fact. We, we, we look to our family. It's, it's a proven fact that girls will marry men like their fathers. That's why mothers cry at weddings. <laughs> There's a third reason. His wife simply won't allow him to lead. <laughs> There's a fourth reason. I gotta move on, get that out of my head. There's a fourth reason. Unruly children run the home. Let me explain. Folks, let me tell you. It's biblical to have discipline in our homes. It's biblical to have discipline. You say, Pastor, are you around, are you around children sometimes and you want to discipline them? No, 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 never. But I am around parents sometimes and I want to discipline them. Mm -hmm. I, I blame the parents. Let's move on. I can get anointed on that point all by myself. <laughs> Reality is, folks, listen, if mother will not allow father to discipline the children, in turn, the children run the home. Children run in the home. Number five, he has a passive personality. He has a passive personality. He's sweet, kind, but he has a problem being stern. He simply just has a passive personality. 
And number six, he never had a role model and his wife didn't either. He never had a role model and his wife didn't either. Let me tell you a story. 19 years old, 19 years old, I'm getting married. Barbara's mother and father sit down with her. Barbara's mother and father say, first of all, we don't want you to marry him. We don't want you to marry him. She backed out the night before we were to get married because her parents said, we don't want you to, get, we don't want you to marry him. Now, I talked her back into it, but she backed out. <laughs> and she said, the reason why we don't want you to marry him is the family he's from. We know about his mother running taverns. We know about all that. We know about his dad. We know, he doesn't even know who his dad is. And then her mother said this. But let me tell you something else, Barbara. He's a preacher. And she said, my daddy was a preacher. And you don't have a clue what you're getting into. You don't have a clue when you marry him what you're getting into. He's going to preach and you don't have a clue. You're going to be left alone more nights than you care to think about. He's going to be out preaching. You're going to be all by yourself. You better think long and hard. But then after they had that discussion, they looked at her and said this. But should you choose to marry him, this 19-year-old kid, the day you marry him, he's your leader. The day you marry him, he's the leader of the home because that's biblical. And I never had a problem because her mother and dad taught her what was biblical from day one, from day one. Now, here's what I want you to understand. In my better than 30 years of preaching, I've had more women. I've had it during this series. I always have it. I have more women come to me and say, Pastor, I'd give anything if my husband would lead our home. But he simply won't. He simply won't lead. I'm crying out. You, you come up real close. Everybody is crying out for leadership. People are drawn to a leader. If you want to raise up followers, listen, if you want to raise up followers, you will add. But if you raise up leaders, you'll multiply. You'll multiply. Now, leading leaders is more difficult. It's like herding cats. But it's still far more successful in life. Now, I've had them ask, what can I do if he won't lead? Let me give you three points. What you can do to facilitate and help your husband to lead. Number one, attention to listening. Attention to listening. You know, the scripture says in James 1 and 19 that we need to be swift to hear. I think there's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth, don't you? I love what Larry King said, the host, the talk show host. Larry King said, I never learned anything while I was talking. I never learned anything while I was talking. 1 Peter 3 and 6 says this. It says, and Sarah obeyed Abraham. That doesn't mean that he's the dictator, he's the boss, she's less than. It doesn't mean she's in fear. Many times women are so much smarter than men. Get real, folks. Get real. Where would the church be? Most church doors would have closed if it had not been for women. Would have closed their doors. But what does it mean she obeyed? It means she paid close attention. She paid close attention. She listened to Abraham. So, well, how do you do that? Well, three things. Sometimes just listen. Sometimes just listen. You know, one man said, my wife and I had words last night, but I didn't get to use mine. <laughs> See, when a man has a problem, he doesn't want his wife to step in and fix the problem. If she steps in and fixes the problem, she's saying to that man, I'm smarter than you are. What a man wants his wife to do is listen. See, I, I've been pastoring all these years and sometimes I'll struggle. I'll struggle with the message and the message that I need to preach. And I'll say to Barbara, I'm, I, I'm, I'm struggling. I'll just be honest with you, folks. I'll just lay her down there where we live. 
sometimes I'll pop off my mouth. And she'll say, you don't have your sermon yet. You don't have your sermon. How'd you know? <laughs> the way you're acting. The way you're acting. I've spoken 16 times in eight days. She said, you're killing yourself. I said, you wash my clothes. Didn't you see that S on my T-shirt? She said, yeah, and it stands for stupid. <laughs> but could you imagine Barbara said, you don't have your sermon? Well, I'll stop by the office. We'll get the commentaries. I'll help you lay that jammy out. It'll be the best one ever. I can give you three points in a poem. I can do it. <laughs> and if she did that, I'd just want to slap her in Jesus' name, Alan. <laughs> no, that, that's not what I need. I'll tell you what I need. I need appreciation for my struggle. I need appreciation for my struggle. I need her to say, honey, I know you've got a lot on you. And then second of all, I need affirmation that I can handle it. I need appreciation for my struggle. And I need affirmation that I can handle it. And that's what your husband needs also. Number two, don't shut down his ideas. Don't shut down. I know a man right now, his wife, everything he mentioned, that's foolish. That won't work. You can't do that. You say, what happened? He quit talking to her because she shut down his ideas. Number three, when he shares his heart, keep it confidential. When he shares his heart, keep it confidential. Now, it's one thing, folks, if you and your husband agree to share a story. That's wonderful. But if you hadn't agreed to share the story, when he shares his heart, you ought to keep it confidential. I've had men say to me, I'm leaving the church. And I'd say, I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to offend you. I hope I've not offended you. Oh, no, Pastor, I love you. What offended me is my wife walked into a class with 25 women. I shared my heart, and she shared it with everybody in the class. That's why I'm not coming back. See, think about this. Hypothetically, let's just say your husband had a picture of you and you were dressed in a fashion that was only appropriate for your husband to look at the picture. Or maybe I should say you weren't dressed. <laughs> but nevertheless, he had the picture. And you heard that he went around and showed it to the guys at work. You say, oh, Brother Benny, what betrayal. It's just as betraying when a man shares his heart with a woman and she shares it with everybody else. It's just as pray. Oh, it's quiet in this Episcopalian church, but I've preached in them before. <laughs> what, what can I do, Pastor? Attention to listening. Number two, allow your husband to lead. Allow your husband to lead. Remember the message title, Park Cars and Vacuums? You've got to provide a vacuum, ma'am, for your husband to lead. See, it's just, it's natural for a man to lead. Look what Genesis 2 and 15 says. It says, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to dress it and keep it. God created, see the Bible not one time says for a man to lead. Why didn't it? Because it's natural for a man to lead. But let me tell you what's unnatural. Look what the scripture says in Genesis 3, 16. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. And in pain you'll give birth. And your desire to control your husband. Your desire to control your husband. See, let me tell you something. Every woman has to provide a vacuum and say to her husband, I want you 
to lead. So I don't have all, all day, folks. You don't either. But let me give you just two practical ways you can do that. These are just simple ways that you can provide that vacuum. Number one, say to your husband, when you're faced with a decision, when your family's got a decision, honey, what do you think we should do? Now, for some of you, after he faints, <laughs> and get back, gets back up, he'll tell you. Second thing I'd say, and this, this is a, a real spiritual context. See, what I've learned about husbands and wives, many times the wife is further along spiritually than the husband is. And, and, and maybe in worship, she's just. <laughs> Not, by the way, if you ask my preference, I like that. I do, that'd be my preference. But don't you ever think, because the husband doesn't respond that way, that somehow she's more spiritual. I learned a long time ago, you can't tell how much gas is in the tank by the honk of the horn. <laughs> I've gone to ball games. The loudest booze sometimes come from the cheapest seats. <laughs> I'm just saying, many times we equate, equate, he's not where I'm at. Well, perhaps he's not. But if he's not, here's what I understand. Sometimes couples will pray together. The wife will say, let's pray. The wife will cut loose praying. God, you are Jehovah Jireh, my provider. God, you are Jehovah Sidkenu, my righteousness. God, you are Jehovah Shalom, my peace. God, you are Jehovah Rohi, my shepherd. God, you are Jehovah Rapha, my healer. And then she says to the husband, you want to pray? <laughs> I'm saying... Sometimes you got to provide a vacuum. And if you provide a vacuum, he might walk up to you and say, look this verse, honey, I found. It's called John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. And you say, wow, let me see that again. <laughs> Attention to listening. Allow your husband to lead. Number three. Admire your husband. Admire your husband. That, that's what the scripture says in Ephesians 5 and 33. Reverence your husband or give him admiration. Gary Smalley said the best two ways to do it is to ask him for his advice and opinion. And number two, to brag on him in front of others. Brag on him in front of others. I was preaching yesterday. Barbara's running the table. I'm signing books. People are saying, man, he's a good preacher. She said, oh, no, he's a great preacher. <laughs> oh, mercy. <laughs> I can't wait till we get home. I'll tell you what. <laughs> No, he's a great preacher. Wow, just make me want to charge hell with a water pistol. <laughs> I'll preach at home, honey, I'll tell you. I'm just saying when you give admiration, admiration. Hey, what's the number one reason why he won't lead? Don't have the confidence. Don't have the confidence. But when you give him admiration, let, let me give you the last point. Always pray for him. Always pray for him. Let, let, let me tell you something. Alan spoke of his daddy, Phil Robertson. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Miss Kay gave her life to Christ. And the family was separated. Phil Robertson was away from the family. He was drinking. He was carousing. Brother Allen just said he was verbally and physically abusive. 
having inappropriate relationships. What did Miss Kay do? She prayed for him. She prayed. And what happened? Phil came back home and said, I want my family back. I want my family back. And she said, what's the difference? He said, I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Can I prove to you that the way to change your husband is not through nagging? Can I prove to you that the way to really change a man is through praying, prayer? See, I don't think, I don't think that we ought to talk to men about God until we talk to God about men. Look what Luke 18 says. And he spake a parable unto them, said men ought always to pray. So that gives the context of what we're dealing with, prayer. There was in a city a judge which feared God, feared not God. He didn't regard man. There was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man. Yeah, because this widow, widow, because this woman keeps praying, I'm going to give her what she's asking for. You can't change anybody. Only God can. You can't change him. Now, now listen to me. I don't have the time. I've talked to you about what women can do to help men. Men, I've got a little more time at 5 o'clock. I'm going to be talking to you about how I can become the leader. What are the steps? What can I do? I, I'm not the leader, Pastor. But what can I do? Just as you've given steps today, I need the steps. I want to do it, Pastor Benny, but I really don't know what to do. I'm going to talk about it at 5 o'clock. You say, well, I really don't need it. And your wife's sitting there thinking, I hope he comes back. Because <laughs> what he calls leadership is not leadership. What can a wife do? Attention to listening. What can a wife do? Allow your husband to lead. What can a wife do? Admire your husband. What can a wife do? Always pray for him. Every head's bowed and every eye's closed. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Pastor, I'm here today. And I don't know that my heart's right with Christ. I don't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I'm ready to meet the Lord. I just don't know. But I am very concerned I know you won't call my name. I know you won't embarrass me. No matter which campus you're in, I promise you we won't. But I'm here today and I don't know that my heart's right with Christ. Brother Benny, I just want you to pray for me. And with no one looking but me and God, you'd say today, Pastor Benny, I don't know that I'm not the man. I'm not the woman I need to be. I, my heart's not right with God. Just pray for me. And right there in the privacy of your pew with no one looking, if you'd like prayer today, Raise your hand real high where I can see it. God bless you. 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 I'm waiting on your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you in the back. God bless you to my right. Now listen. If you raised your hand that you don't know that you're right with God, Pray this prayer with me. Repeat this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. 
But God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry I want to change. I believe that you died for my sin. And I confess them to you right now. Come into my heart, Lord. Come into my life and forgive me. Now, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Thank you for coming into my life. If you prayed that prayer, hold your hand up real high where I can see it. Just lay it up real high where I can see it. That's it. You're doing great. You're doing great. You're doing great. You're doing fabulous. You're doing fabulous. You're doing wonderful. I couldn't be prouder. I couldn't be prouder. You're doing great. Tremendous. Just raise your hand up. You're doing fabulous. That is awesome. That's awesome. You're doing tremendous. Couldn't be prouder of you. All of our campuses, people raising their hands. How we praise the Lord. That's wonderful. Now listen to me very closely. How many wives would say, Pastor Benny, the message spoke to my heart today. Pray for me. You'd slip your hand up. Hands up all over. How many men would say, Pastor, the message today spoke to my heart. Please pray for me and you slip your hand. Now listen very closely. In a matter of seconds, we'll be singing. You say, Brother Benny, who, who will respond at the altar? Oh, it's the same people that's been responding for over 30 years. It's the people with the best marriages. It's the people with the best marriages. Because they realize what sustains the marriage is prayer. It's always the people with the best marriages. And they come and they thank God for what he's done in their family. They come and they pray for their children. They come and they thank God that he brought them together. They come and they pray about situations. It's always the best marriages that come down and just say, hey, we just want to thank you. We just want to thank you, Lord. And we've got some issues we're praying about. We've got some situations in our family. We've got some things we just want to pray about. That's always what happens. Folks, let's stand to our feet. We're standing to our feet. Everybody's standing. At every campus in just a moment, we're going to start singing. I wonder, maybe today, I just, maybe you'd say to your wife, I've messed up some, but if I had it to do all over again, I'd sure do it with you. Maybe you'd say to your husband, I've messed up some, but if I had it to do over again, I'd sure do it with you. Let's just go today and thank God for bringing us together. As we sing, you come. I want to take this opportunity just to thank you for worshiping the Lord with us today at Rock Springs Church. It's been a joy and a delight to have you with us. I trust that this entire worship service has been an encouragement, edification, and a challenge in your life. If you've made the decision for Jesus Christ, or perhaps you just have a special prayer request that you'd like to talk to somebody, or you'd like to have prayer concerning, be sure and contact Rock Springs Church at the email address at the bottom of your screen. Again, God bless you. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon, and thank you for joining us at Rock Springs Church.